if we have a title. All right, if you guys are on Zoom, I want you to shout out. Let me know if you can hear me. I'm going to pull up the comments just to make sure on the chat on Zoom. Uh, Facebook is now live streaming. If you guys are on Instagram, uh, let me know if you guys can hear me as well. Looks like John is here. Great to see you, John. Awesome. All right, guys. So things are looking great. Let me just make sure our Facebook video is cracking. And uh, I want to dive into this. And if you're first just joining us for the first time today, um, what I want to do is welcome you to our, our weekly wealth creation course. And um, this is something we do every Friday. Every Friday, I dive into how wealth is built, how it's created. Uh, and this week specifically, I'm talking about debt. Okay. And the reason I'm talking about debt this week is I was sitting there just the other day and I was thinking about, okay, you know, what should I teach on Friday? What do I need to share with people this week? What is going to be the most helpful? And when I go on my Facebook right now, virtually all I see is virus and politics and China and freaking Kim Jong-un. Who knows if that guy's dead or alive, right? But it's a bunch of unhelpful hysteria and it's being shared like crazy. And, and it's, it's something I've observed where I'm under the impression that I think people right now have kind of forgotten exactly where they were a month ago. No income, no job, no savings, right? It's called a ninja. No income, no job, no assets. You don't want to be a ninja. People have been ninjas for the last month and didn't know it. And, and the problem with that is, is these distractions that come along politics and medical stuff and all of the you know things that blow up on the news – they don't affect our day-to-day -day lives. They don't help us with our finances. They don't, at the end of the day, they're not going to pay my rent. They're not going to do anything on, on, on my personal finances for me, but it, it pulls my attention. Okay. Attention is a very valuable thing. So when I started thinking this week, I was like, all right, what do I want to share with people? What's going to be the most helpful? Um, I started to think about, okay, well, people right now are probably in debt, probably more in debt than usual because usual, they didn't work for the last six weeks. The average American right now is paycheck to paycheck. 80% of us, we can't go one pay period without missing a check. We missed a check, we're broke. That's 80% of America today. And, and so I was thinking that's probably where people are at right now. That was my perception on, man, people who haven't been working, they didn't have savings, they probably racked up the credit cards and, and still the economy hasn't fixed itself. It hasn't taken off yet. That's where people need help right now. And that's the purpose of my talk topic tonight. I addressed this earlier um, several months ago, and I want to dive into it again because it's so important. It's so important for us to understand how to pay off debt. Now, before, before I talk about how to pay off debt, we really have to understand what debt is and where it comes from. Okay, So debt, as we probably know, if you don't know, I don't want to assume, but if you don't know, debt means that I owe money to somebody else. I didn't have, therefore I had to borrow. Okay, anytime I've ever had debt, that's the only reason why. I lacked income, I lacked savings, therefore I had to borrow money. That was it. There's no magic secret behind that. That's how I ever got in debt. My very first debt that I had was a credit card. Okay, if your first debt was a credit card, I want to see I want to see some reactions on on Facebook and Instagram. Um, on Instagram, unfortunately, I, th I think the only only reaction is hearts. Okay, but if you're on Facebook, if your first debt was a credit card, I want to see some angry faces because that credit card is the first trap. Okay, so mine was a credit card, Alaska Airlines credit card. Everyone in Alaska gets one, and you get free plane ticket every year, and you get bonus miles and all this stuff. But what happens is it's it's this little tiny bit. I charge the credit card up because at one point I lacked savings and I lacked income. And then because I didn't fix that problem, I then couldn't pay the credit card down. Think about that. The credit card company, they're not idiots. These are multi-billion dollar corporations. That's the cheese on the trap. I'm going to get you to charge the card. I know statistically speaking, if you're the average American, you're not going to be able to pay me back. And I'm going to get you at that point. Okay, there, there's no free lunch. There's no free lunch with credit cards. So that was my first debt. I had a credit card. Now, the second thing I did is, is I bought a car. Very normal, very normal, not, not insane. Like I bought a, I think I bought a 2010 Chevy Cobalt. It was bright red, um, you know, kind of medium base model, a little bit of extra stuff on it. You know, I didn't have to manually roll the windows down, but in my mind, that was like my hot rod. I was like, man, I just have my new car brand new. I'm excited, but the payment was 350 bucks a month. 
Okay. And I'm not here to preach to you, Dave Ramsey, like say you can't afford a car and you need to cut up all your credit cards. That's not the message. The message is the average American right now gives over 60% of their income to financial institutions, not to themselves. The 60% of my income going to banks, going to car payments, going to mortgage payments, going to credit card payments, going to student loan payments, going to taxes, going to the 401k. We covered this a couple of weeks back. I can't save 40% to invest and build wealth if I'm giving most of my income away to institutions. That's the message tonight. Okay. So I start racking up credit card, car loan. Okay. Didn't even realize the insurance was going to be more than the car. I was paying three, 320 something for the car and like 425 bucks a month for the insurance. Right. And so, so what I started doing is I started stacking up debt. I got into business, had to acquire debt because I didn't have income and I didn't have savings. Now, the problem was this. Okay. The problem was I didn't realize how debt works. In order to realize how debt works, I have to think like a bank. I can't think like Dave Ramsey. I can't think like Susie Orman. I can't think like my parents. I need to think like a bank. What's in it for the bank? Okay. Here, Here's the thing with banks, when they lend us that money, that 0% that interest rate credit card for the first 18 months, that money they loaned us, and I, I don't want to lose you guys here, I want to keep it very simple, that money they loaned us, they didn't actually have. See, a long time ago, banks used to work like this. I would deposit my income into, into your bank. I'd say, hey, guys, I, I need to, because it was backed by gold. I was like, hey, I have gold. I'm going to deposit it. You give me gold certificates because it's it's inconvenient for me to carry this gold around. And you'd say, great. Or I'd put my money in and say, hey, I don't want to carry all this money around in my house. Your bank looks safer. Can you keep it there instead? Okay, and you would. And what would happen is you would loan my money out to other people. Okay, so I'd give you my 10 grand to deposit in your bank in my savings account or in my checking account. You would then loan that to Lexi for a car loan, or you would loan that to Eric for his mortgage, right? And that was a very normal system. That was how banking worked. And so what happened is if you had the 10 grand, you could loan the 10 grand. Well, eventually what it turned into is if you had the 10 grand in your bank, you were allowed to loan up to a hundred grand, even though you only had 10 grand. So think about if I, if I'm loaning out a hundred grand, but I only have 10 grand, that means that I don't actually have the money to loan out. It's just digits on a screen at that point. And it's important to realize this because when a bank loans out that 300 grand on a mortgage, they didn't give you 300 grand because they didn't have it in the first place. They gave you 300,000 on, on, on digits on a screen. And now I'm paying on that mortgage, real income from my real paycheck to them to pay back money that they loaned me that they didn't have in the first place. I know that's very confusing. I want to make sure you understand and the simplicity of that. I, I have this mouse, I can give it to you. Let's pretend I didn't have this mouse, but I could still give it to you. And then I made you pay me every month to use a mouse that wasn't even mine in the first place. That's what banks are doing. So when I'm looking at debt, I have to think like a bank. A bank really does not care about interest. Okay, interest is important to realize it's just a factor. It's a numerical factor, meaning it's part of the equation and it's utilized to lengthen the amount of time I have to pay the bank my income. See, the consumer, the consumer, we're taught as the consumer to think about the interest. What about all the interest I'm paying? What's ironic is we never think about the income. The bank doesn't care about the interest. It's, it's literally made up money. They're earning an infinite rate of return regardless of what you pay them because they're getting a percentage of your income now for a fixed period of time or a variable period of time based on the debt that they gave you. They want your income. They're very good at it. They have it coming through on credit cards, on cars, on mortgages, on student loans. Uh, now it's going to be on SBA loans and PPP loans. So banks are masters at collecting your income and my income and keeping it for very large quantities of time. And interest is used as a way to basically add a portion of that payment that I give them that's not going towards principal. So it lengthens the amount of time I owe them. They get more of my money for a longer period of time. So critical to understand that, okay? That, that's why on a mortgage, they'll give you more mortgage money at 3%. It's not the 3% that they care about. It's the 30 years. It's that they're going to have your income for the next 30 years. They will make 1200 bucks a month or 1500 bucks a month off of you and 10 other people from one deposit that they got for the next 30 years. That's what banks are looking for. So 
that's important to realize. When I start thinking like a bank, I realize how I have to pay off my debt. Because it's not about it's not about how can I be debt free immediately. It's about how can I be financially free, right? Because there's two mentalities with debt. There's I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to pretend it's not happening, and I'm going to live in denial. And I'll just keep racking it up on credit cards, and I'll do balance transfers and refinances if I have to. And that's how I'm going to manage my debt. We call that debt management when it's really not. And and, and that's the first approach. The second approach that I see is gazelle intense. I'm going to throw all of my money at the debt. All of it's going to go towards the debt. And when the debt's gone, I can finally live because I'll be debt free. And being debt free is the best thing in the world. That's the other approach I see. Okay. Both of those are incorrect. The first approach, I'm basically, it's like a mosquito is just sucking the life out of me for the rest of my life financially. They're just going to continue pounding and pounding and pounding and pounding and pounding. Because they don't have to, they don't have to do anything else. I'm just sitting there, non-confront, not paying it off, right? The second approach, which is the Dave Ramsey approach, is also incorrect because it, it's costing me opportunity cost. That money that I'm giving to the creditor, like that money is money that I could invest. That money is money that I could use to avoid going into further debt. It's money that I could put into my business. So I have to really look at if I'm trying to pay off debt, I'm thinking like the bank. I'm not thinking like a consumer. I'm not thinking like Dave Ramsey. I'm not thinking like Suze Orman. I'm thinking like the bank. The bank at the end of the day thinks like an investor. They're thinking about return on their money. They're thinking about time value of money, and they're thinking about how long they can have the maximum amount of your paycheck for the longest period of time possible, and all of their equations surround that, okay? Meaning, meaning my debt for me is a debt. For them, it's an asset. On my balance sheet, it's a liability. On their balance sheet, it's an asset. So when I'm trying to pay off debt, the mindset that I need to have is one of an investor. I'm not paying off debt. I'm actually buying it back from them. I'm investing to take it from their balance sheet as an asset to then instead my balance sheet as an asset. And, and if I don't fix what caused the debt, I'm never going to get out. Okay, what caused the debt was not interest. What caused the debt was not my credit card. What caused the debt was not even the circumstance that made me have to charge it. What caused the debt was not the fact that I couldn't afford to buy the car, but I could afford the payments. What caused the debt was 100% <clears throat> completely and simply, I lacked money. I didn't have the bucks to pull the trigger and buy the vehicle myself. I didn't have the money to handle the emergency out of pocket. Therefore, I had to charge the credit card and finance the vehicle. That's the only reason I had debt. Okay, so if I'm going to fix the debt problem, I have to fix the preceding problem, which is the fact that I was financially insolvent. I didn't have money. If I don't fix that, I'm going to pay off all the debt and still not have money and still be behind the eight ball trying to catch up. Okay, so there's a very specific way we go about paying off debt that I'm going to show you tonight. Now, for those of us watching, there are two different behaviors with debt. Okay, I'm not going to say there's two different types of debt because there's no such thing as types of debt. Debt's debt. There's two different behaviors with debt. Behavior one is using debt for consumption. You've heard people call that bad debt. Okay, debt, debt didn't piss on the carpet. It's not bad debt. It's not a dog. Okay, debt is just an inanimate, an inanimate object. So I used bad behavior with debt if I financed the vehicle or I funded a freaking college diploma, which is a $40,000 piece of paper that I'm going to get now guarantee with an income I don't even have. Right? That's not bad debt. That's just unintelligent activity. That's bad behavior with money. Okay, just like there's no such thing as good debt. Debt is debt. The same mortgage that I could tell you is bad debt is the same mortgage that I could go finance real estate with. It's the same thing. It's not bad debt or good debt. It's bad behavior and good behavior. It's financial literacy and financial illiteracy. Okay, so, so I want to just plant that seed as we're going through this tonight. Now, most of what I'm addressing tonight is going to be how do I handle debt if I've had bad behavior with it? Meaning I financed a bunch of consumer expenses that don't produce income. Okay, I'm not talking about real estate deals. I'm not talking about leverage for your business. I'm not talking about any of that. So, because there's, and the reason I say that is there's always that Robert Kiyosaki guy sitting in the back of the room with his popcorn. That's like, that's not true. What if you use it for leverage? That's a totally different thing. Totally different thing. We're not talking about that. Okay, what we're talking about is consumer debt, bad behavior with debt. Okay, so let me show you guys what I worked on today. I'm going to pull up a couple of illustrations and share my screen for you. 
All right, let's go ahead and share my screen for Facebook. If you guys are on Instagram, by the way, um, and you would like to see the slides tonight, if you'd like to see the screen, go to my Facebook page, Jerry Feta. And we actually have this on Zoom. So there's an entire screen you can see of, of um, basically what I'm going over and you'll be able to see the illustrations and the numbers with it. Um, but if you would like to, to see that on your and you're on Instagram, go to my Facebook, Jerry Feta. You'll be able to see that on, on the calculator. So check this out. This, this is um, just a basic financial calculator. It's called Dinky Town. If you want to check it out, it's free. Um, and we do have an app we use internally for, for clients on this, but this is something I wanted to show you guys. Okay. So what I have here is, is a lineup of debt. Okay. A lineup of debt. And this basically shows somebody with their current debts, right? And so what we have here is we have 15 grand in credit card debt. This is just a hypothetical thing. It's not a real client or a real person, but we show $15,000 in credit card debt. Uh, we show 55 grand between two auto loans. Um, we show student loans, we show a mortgage. What you see here is the sacred account loan. This is not actually a debt, but it's part of how we're gonna pay this down. Um, but all in all, this person has about 400 grand in debt, okay? They have uh, $3,200 per month going out towards their debts and they have $750 a month they can put towards their debt extra. That's what this shows here, okay? Now, what we're doing is, is basically they have all of this debt. We're saying, all right, there's two ways we can go about this, really three. We could do nothing, okay? And, and if we do nothing, I want to show you guys what this looks like. If we do nothing, this person basically just lets their debt ride it out and they hope that it's going to be taken care of. I want to show you guys what that looks like. If we do absolutely nothing, this person will be in debt for the next 13 years. Okay, and, and basically they're going to pay about 120 grand in interest, okay? The, and this, this is with just snowballing. So when I say do nothing, I'm still saying we're snowballing the debt. If they don't snowball, it's totally different. They're gonna pay 225 grand in interest. Um, they're probably in debt way beyond that length of time as well, right? But I wanna show you do nothing is not a good plan. Okay, because this is the average person. They don't have a strategy to get out of debt. They don't have a written plan. They don't have any idea. They're just basically going to pay their minimums and throw some extra at it if they can. Okay, that's not a good strategy. Okay, and, and basically, yeah, if they didn't do anything, they'd be, in, they'd be in debt for 30 years, basically. So basically, that's the option is I'm going to be in debt for 30 years if I do nothing, right? Current payoff is 30 years, and, and that's comfortable today. But let me tell you what, in 30 years, this person is going to be elderly and broke. They're going to be 60 years old. They're going to have nothing to their name except for a paid off house. And I, I see that way too often. The house does not help you when you're 60. Okay. So, so that's option one. We do nothing. Okay. Now here's the other option. We have something called the sacred account debt buyout. So what we do is we have um, the same debt line out, same exact debts. Nothing has changed on their debts, but what we did is they have a thousand dollars per month. They're going to put that $1,000 per month into their sacred account. Every single month, they're going to do that, okay? Of the 1000 that they're putting in, they're allowed to borrow 750 of it. That's where you see that 75, 750, 75%, okay? So what we're doing is we're, we're lining up the debts. We're stacking that $1,000 a month away into the sacred accounts. 750 of that every month becomes available for me to borrow out and put towards paying down my debt. And I want to show you guys the difference here because we just looked at, we just looked at, again, 30 years of payoff without this strategy, and they're going to pay 225 grand in interest. So what does it look like if we use the sacred account? So let's check this out. So basically, we reduce our interest to 100,000 instead of 225, and we get entirely out of debt in 11 years and six months instead of 30 years. Okay, what's important about this is that the 11 year six month mark, we now have $4,000 a month freed up. Now, here's the thing that I want to help you guys catch here the sacred account. Why are, we, why are we doing that? Why are we putting the debt towards the sacred account first? Well, the reason why is again, if we go back up here, that thousand a month we're putting in the sacred accounts, that money, even though we're borrowing 750 of it, that thousand is still growing at a three to 5% average annual compounding interest rate. 
Okay, it's still growing at that rate. So what that means is while I'm paying off my debt, that money that I'm depositing, the full thousand dollars, even though I'm borrowing 750 of it out, is still growing like I never touched it. So important to see because at the end of this, right, I'm out of I'm out of debt much sooner. That's awesome. But guess what's also awesome? At the end of this period, I have $184,000 in my sacred account. Okay, I, this is so powerful. I'm out of debt in 11 years. I was going to be out of debt in 30 years. I'm out of debt now in 11 and a half years. I was going to pay 225 grand in interest. Now I'm only going to pay 100. In 30 years when I'm out of debt, I was going to have $0 saved because all of my money was going towards my debt. In this scenario, when I'm out of debt in 11 years, I'm going to have 185 grand saved. Do you guys see the paradigm shift there? What this does, like this is so powerful. This guarantees that I will never go back in debt because I have 184 grand in my sacred account that I can use now to finance my own vehicles, to invest, to do whatever the hell I want to do with it. And I don't have to answer to a bank ever again. So powerful. And this is with a thousand dollars a month extra going towards my debt. What if I did two grand? What if I did three? What if I what if I went crazy and I actually listened to Jerry and tried to save 40% of my income and I did it with that? Like the, the results are incredible. Now, for those of you guys that, that want a real quick breakdown on this again, because I want to make sure we understood this, right? We had a bunch of debt. Again, let me pull it back up again. We had 15 grand in credit card. We had 55,000 in auto loans. We had 380 between student loans and mortgage and other things like that. And my current payoff, as it says here, was going to take more than 30 years. And I was going to pay $225,000 in interest. Then we bring the sacred account in. We're putting $1,000 a month into the sacred accounts. Of that $1,000 per month in the sacred account, $750 of that is available for, available for me to borrow against while my 1000 still grows. Okay, we're tracking. Put in a thousand into the sacred account, we can pull 750 out to go put towards my debt. That's that's how this works. Now, by doing that, we're then going to snowball the sacred account towards my debt. We can see the exact line up here. The first debt, $2,500 credit card. We wiped that one out in three months. We've now freed up $1,018 a month to put towards the next credit card, which is 3,500 bucks. We pay that one off in seven months. We then snowball that down to the next credit card, which is 4,000 bucks. We now have $1,184 to put towards that. We pay it off in 10 months and we just continue going down the line. And you can see as I pay off each one of these debts, I just keep stacking it back in and then pulling it back out of my sacred accounts to pay off the next one. And what I see here is I pay off the student loan right? Pay off the student loan. Um, that's at 47 months. I pay my sacred account loan back in full, and then I start working on the mortgage. Now it's critical. Again, I want to really, I don't want to get too off in the weeds. I would never try and just pay off a house early. What I would do here is I would convert the mortgage to a first lien home equity line of credit as soon as I possibly could and be able to use that to then finance more investments. I'd never actually pay off the house. I think that's a terrible idea. Okay, but what this shows is it shows when I do that, I'm entirely out of debt on everything in 11 years and six months. And since my money was still growing in the background, that thousand dollars a month the entire time at that 11 years and six month marker, I'm debt free. I've got four grand a month of my income back and I've got one hundred and eighty five thousand dollars in the bank. How is that for a comparison? Okay, did everyone understand that? If you didn't understand that, I want you to drop it in the comments really quick because I'm going to show you a little bit more math here and I don't want to jump into that until I know you guys are uh, up and running. <laughs> John John Moss says, what's up, handsome? I just caught that. Thank you, John. I appreciate you. Um, so, so I want to make sure everyone understands that before we dive into the numbers here on the next part. Okay, I see some, some mind-blown emojis. Um, it looks like people are tracking. Justin Goff says, I just paid my first premium premium into my sacred account today. Justin, that's awesome. Um, I'm excited for you, man. You have, you, you have no idea. So I want to go ahead and show you guys the rest of the numbers here. Okay. Because because I want to do justice to, I'm a skeptical guy, right? So if I'm watching this, I'm like, okay, well, where's the catch? Right. So I want to show you guys the, the alternative scenario. Because this is where my mind initially went. Because I wasn't always a, a, a life insurance guy. 
Okay, if you didn't know, I was a Dave Ramsey endorsed local provider for a number of years in eight or nine different states, and I thought whole life insurance was the devil, and that's what the sacred account is, is it's whole life insurance. So when I started first looking at the numbers, I was very skeptical. I was like, man, where's the catch? Like, what, what if we just did it Uncle Dave's way? was my alternative. I was like, okay, well, what if we didn't put it in the sacred account? Because if I put a thousand in, I can only pull out 750. So what if instead I just put all of it towards the debt and then I do the sacred account later? I had someone text me that this week. He's like, oh, I'm just going to do this instead. This is this is why I wouldn't do that. Okay. Um, I actually ran the numbers on that for you guys. So I'm putting a thousand a month directly towards my debt, meaning we're not using the sacred account at all. I'll even show you. Okay. Um, final sacred account loan. We're going to completely delete that. There's no numbers there. Okay. All of it's good. So if we hit calculate. Okay. View the report. All right. So check this out. Now the skeptics watching initially are going to be like, see, I was right, but I want to show you something. All right. So we're paying off all of the debt in nine years and eight months, nine years and eight months. Okay. That's if we don't use the sacred account. Okay, now, now some of us are going to look at that and be like, see, that's why you shouldn't do it because you're out of debt sooner. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and agree with you. You are out of debt sooner. Not, not only are you out of debt sooner, you save more interest being out of debt sooner. Okay, now the skeptic again is going to say, okay, well, at that point, I freed up 42.53 a month. Why don't I just save that? And then I can just, you know, save the money up then and I can get there just as fast. So I did the math on that. So we have 42.53 a month at 4%. It takes us three and a half years to get there, right? Because on the previous example, we had 184 grand saved, and this was at the end of, of basically the 12 years, okay? So if we bypass the sacred account entirely, we pay off all of the debt first, then we do the sacred account after all of the debt's been paid off, and we start saving at that point. Well, we're out of debt, like it says here, in nine years and eight months, and then at that point, for us to get to $180,000, it's going to take us about three and a half years, so you do the math on that. We have nine years and eight months plus three years. That puts us at 12 years and eight months, right? Plus we still have another six months. So that puts us at 12 years and eight months plus six months. I think that puts us at um, 14, almost 14 and a half years. Okay, so it will take me 14 and a half years just to catch up. This is if I don't do the sacred account. This is if I put all of my money towards my debt first, pay it all down first, and then take $4,000 a month and stack that away in my sacred account. It will take me 14 years before I have 180 grand put away. Whereas on the previous one with the sacred account, it took me 11 and a half years. Okay, so do I want to be debt free with 185 grand put away in 11 years, or do I want to be debt free in in 185 grand put away in 14 years? Three years is a long time, guys. I appreciate skepticism, but not when it's incorrect. Okay, so I did want to run the numbers for you on that. Now, now if we're really being fair, if we're really being fair in apples to apples, then we would say, okay, well, at the 12 year marker, we have 184,193. Right. So let's go ahead and put that in 184, 193. That's at 12 years. Now we just said that we're going to go to 14 years. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, well, let's compare real apples to apples because on this deal over here, if we don't use the sacred account, we get to save for 14 years. Whereas on the sacred account, we only showed it for like 11 and a half years. So let's show them both at 14 years and see which one looks better. So at the 12 year marker, I've got 184, 183. I'm going to put that away from 12 year from uh, 12 years to 14 years. So that's another two years, and I've also now paid off all of my debt, right? So I have 42.53 a month left over. All right, so let's see what that does. So at 14 years with the sacred account, I have 305 thousand dollars. So scenario A, do nothing be in debt for 30 years, never get out, never have money saved. Scenario B, use the sacred account, be out of debt in basically 12 years, have 185 grand put away at the end of the 12 years. Or scenario C, put all of my money towards my debt first, 
Once I'm out, then I attempt to play catch up with my bigger payment and it takes me 14 years to get out. But at the same 14 year marker, if I, I would have done the sacred account, I would have had 305 grand. Like, like those of us that are watching this and saying, what's the catch? There's no catch. The catch is it costs us some money to set up this, this, this account. That's it. Everything costs money. The catch is that this is what Fortune 500 companies and the largest banks in the world do with their money. Okay. If you want to ask what the, what's the catch, I want you to look at the numbers we just looked at over here, being in debt forever or, or even worse, putting all of my money towards debt. The problem with the debt snowball, guys, like putting all of it towards debt like this, if I'm putting it all towards debt the way that we just looked at over here, this means that for the next 10 years of my life, I'm going to be broke. For the next 10 years of my life, I'm going to have zero savings. For the next 10 years of my life, I'm not going to be earning compound interest. For the next 10 years of my life, every single emergency could potentially put me back in debt. That's the problem with the debt snowball. That's what the sacred account solves. Because what we're doing with the sacred account is we're paying into it until we have enough saved to then wipe out an entire debt, which means all the way up to the point that I do that, I have money put away. Which means if something comes up in the meantime, I can go use that money if I need to instead of going back into debt. I'm borrowing now from myself and breaking the cycle of having to go to a bank to get money for consumer finance. Like it's a mindset shift. It's different. And, and, and it doesn't matter what the vehicle is called that we're using for this. It doesn't matter that it's whole life and nobody cares. At the end of the day, it's, it's what is it doing for me? What results is it producing? And is the math better? And if the math is better, I'm doing what the math is better on every single time. Okay, so so a couple of things to realize here. If we go back to the sacred account model that we looked at, we go back to oops, we go back to this guy here, <clears throat> right? So part of this, and this is important. Part of this is this also means while we're doing this, we stop borrowing. Okay, if I'm really trying to break the cycle of debt, I can't keep getting loans. Okay, I have a client I've been talking to the last couple of days. I'm trying to help him do this. Dude, just load it up on, on SBA loans. It's like you just reversed everything we started working on together. Like, like the again, the problem, if I had to go get an SP, SBA loan, the problem wasn't COVID-19 and, and, and the shutdown. The problem was I didn't have enough freaking money saved to close my doors for four weeks. That's the problem. That's not a fun thing to think about. And it kind of stings to hear someone say that, but that's the problem. If I don't have four weeks worth of savings, what am I doing? this four weeks guys that's a month that's for my business that's like maybe 20 30 grand for four weeks if i don't have that saved i can't really say i run a business if i'm an employee and i don't have five grand put away from the paychecks i've been getting every single month for the last three years like I, what am i doing Right. So part of this is i have to stop borrowing money i can't get out of debt and do all of this if i keep adding more Okay. The other aspect of this is the sacred account is a forced savings plan. So those, those of us that, that don't know what that is, it means that every single month it's pulling out of my income. It's not voluntary. It's involuntary, meaning I sign up, I pick a date every single day that month. The sacred account is, in this instance, pulling out $1,000 a month, whether I liked it or not. Okay. And a lot of us, that's uncomfortable to think about. When I first thought of that, I was not okay with it. I was like, man, that seems like a risk. That seems like lack of control. That seems almost like, because it's insurance, it almost seems like it's a cost, right? I, and at that point in time, I just didn't understand how money worked. I, I was financially illiterate. I didn't understand the strategy here. But here's the thing, guys. The banks do the same thing. Every single day, every single month, a certain day of the month, the bank is going to take out my car payment. Okay, every single day, every single month, a certain day of the month, they're going to take out my mortgage, my credit cards. The IRS does that with my taxes. So literally every financial institution I deal with trusts me so little with my money that they take it before I get it. So why would I do it any different? If I'm really going to be successful, I need to think about the bank. How's the bank doing it? The bank wants my money before I see it. So then I need to mimic the same behavior with the way that I save and invest. My sacred account gets my money before I see it. 
I've said this time and time again, pay yourself first is not a sentiment. It is a literal instruction. Okay. Pay myself first. It doesn't mean that, oh, I understood that concept. That sounds really good, but I'm still going to wait till the end of the month to save what's left over. That's literally paying myself last. Okay. Paying myself first is uncomfortable. The sacred account forces me to do that. Okay. Now what's even better What's even better is now that I don't have to worry about the sacred account, like I've paid off all my debt, right? We fast forward to the 11 years and six months. I've paid off all my debt. I've got my payments freed up. I've now got four grand a month freed up. That's a lot of income. Four grand a month is freed up now. That's that's literally, I could, if I'm making 10,000 a month, I could save four grand a month. I'm saving 40% of my income. That's a lot. That's 50 grand a year almost that I'm putting away now simply by getting rid of debt. Okay. The other factor to look at here too is the next time I need something, whether it be a car or whether it be a mortgage, let's go back to our, our initial number here. 12 years, we were doing a thousand bucks. Our initial number here <clears throat> was about 185,000. Next time I need something, I don't have to borrow money from the bank. I can borrow it from my sacred accounts, meaning that when I go buy a car, I could walk in there with 40 grand from my sacred account, pay cash for the vehicle, not have to make payments to the bank and instead pay my sacred account a monthly car payment. And now I'm earning interest on my car. I could do that now. Or if I wanted to, I could put this down on an investment deal. If I make 12%, I'm going to make $1,800 a month, at least for the next five to 10 years. And I can take that 1800 bucks a month I'm making now and funnel that back into my sacred account again and go do another one and another one and another one. And before I know it, by the 30-year marker, I've been financially free for the last decade instead of just getting out of debt or instead of playing catch up because I handled all my debt first. Okay, so so this is this is something that is super important to know. It's something that is a game changer and it's something that requires a lot of um, financial literacy and also emotional discipline. Okay. Meaning that I, I don't have time in this plan to get emotional. I don't have time to, to be afraid of what if I can't make the thousand dollar month contribution? Cause if I was really thinking that when, when I bought my car, what I was, I thinking, can I really make the payment? No, I wasn't. It was an impulsive buy. So how come we're, we're all of a sudden different when it comes to saving? Okay, I have a client today, and I'm not going to share who it was, but greatest text message I ever got. And, and it relates to what I just mentioned, like people that, that have been doing the wrong thing. And when presented with doing the right thing, they need to pray about it or they need to think about it. And she's in fitness. Okay, so she hears I need to pray about it a lot. Like, you know, before I get on this plan, I need to pray about it and think about it. And she's like, man, what I wish I could say, I wish I could say, did you pray about it and think about it before you got fat? Okay, I'm going to repeat that. Did you pray about it and think about it before you got fat? Right? Again, kind of stings. I wouldn't say that to someone, but it's true. Where was that in debt? Right? So now that it's crunch time and it's like, hey, I could actually make something happen here. I can pay this off early and change my life financially. But now all of a sudden, I've got to think about it. Or I've got to pray about it. Did I sit down and kneel before I signed up for the car? No. Okay. How much thought did I put into it before I impulsively bought the 30 year mortgage just because all of my peers bought a house and I felt like that was the right thing to do too? None. So why would I all of a sudden insert that invalid objection, that illogical reasoning into this equation when it's actually a right move? It's going to help me instead of hurt me when all the stuff I've done before hurt me. In those moments, I, I was impulsive. I didn't think about it. I didn't pray about it. I didn't ask a decision maker. I didn't consult with anyone. But all of a sudden, when it comes to taking control of my finances, now I'm all of a sudden Socrates. And I'm thinking about it and I'm praying about it and I'm getting all this advice. Like that's, that's not how it works. And the problem here is guys, I ran into this this week as well. When I do that stuff, usually I don't actually think about it. That's the thing that I say personally, when I want, when I want to put off a decision that I don't want to have to make. Personally, I also don't pray about it. When I tell people I'm going to pray about it, I usually don't. I go on with my day, I get busy and forget. And if I did pray about it, God's not going to tap me on the shoulder and be like, hey, yeah, you should do that thing. 
I can very, very clearly go look and find out what he says about money and debt, and all this stuff and figure out, oh, <laughs> turns out God agrees this is probably the right thing for me to do. Okay, and the advice part is the worst because when I go ask for advice, I'm also, and I'm not realizing I'm doing this, I'm invalidating my own ability to think and reason. And I'm basing my, my reality on somebody else's point of view. They don't have context and they don't have education. So I had a client, a client this week tell me, hey, I talked to a CPA and my CPA thinks I need to just pay all my debt off first. We'll talk about the sacred account later. I just need to pay off all of my debt first. Okay. And I texted him. I was like, bro, no offense, but your CPA probably doesn't know how this stuff works. Your CPA doesn't know about sacred accounts. If we were to compare my balance sheet versus his balance sheet, I bet I win. Okay. Your CPA is probably making about 60 to $70,000 a year salary, struggling with the same problem you are. And they're just telling you what their parents told them or what they learned from Dave Ramsey. Like that's the importance with being financially literate is I actually understand this stuff. I don't, I don't have to go ask somebody because Jerry knows. I know for myself. I put in the time to study this. I don't have to think about it because it's math. How long does is, is it take me to figure out two plus two equals four? It's like that because I understand math. So I typed all this out today because I want to show you the math makes sense in the direction of the sacred account. That's not something we have to think about. It's now a well-established fact right? What I'm really dealing with is, is my own emotion and my own behavior. Meaning in the past with my finances, if I'm this guy right now where I've got, you know, all of this debt, I've got, you know, I've got 15,000 in credit cards and I've got all of this money in, in, in auto loans and mortgages. If I'm that guy right now in my life, it means that I have been operating on a reactive basis, I've not been planning ahead. In fact, I didn't plan ahead 15,000 times. You guys catch where I'm going with that? If I had 15 grand in credit card debt, that's 15,000 times I didn't plan ahead. Right? So, so same thing with the auto loan. If I had 55 grand in auto loan debt, it means that I was broke when I bought my first vehicles. Okay? So, so those are things we've got to look at is I'm not looking at does this make sense? Is this logical mathematically? Is it suited for me? Because the answer to all that is yes. The real question I'm trying to answer is, am I ready to change my behavior? This is the same mechanism that makes me go from, um, you know, on the verge of divorce to having a healthy marriage. Am I ready to change my behavior? Or go from overweight to fit. Am I ready to change my behavior? Or go from broke to wealthy. Am I ready to change my behavior? And it doesn't have to be an everyday thing. That's the beauty of this. I have to change my behavior once to do the sacred account one time, because all I have to do is then call Jerry. Jerry signs me up for this. That one time decision now pulls it out of my bank account every single month, whether I choose to that month or not. Because the problem with behavior is if I've been doing it the wrong way for 10 years, that's 10 years of habits. That's 10 years of, of habits and behaviors that have built up that are not productive and they're actually causing me harm. So for me to think that I'm going to reverse 10 years of habits in a one-time motivated session on a Friday night or, or you know, a seminar that I went to for, for six weeks on a Dave Ramsey course, that's not going to change my habits from, from the last 10 years. That's now programmed into me to operate that way. So what I've got to do is I've got to build a foolproof plan that is going to work regardless of my habits because my old habits are still going to come back. If I'm broke, it's because I spend money on things I shouldn't. And so when I try and spend money on things I shouldn't, there's going to be $1,000 or less in my bank when I go to do that because it went into my sacred account first. Just like if I'm trying to go to the gym, right? I need to hire a personal trainer. Not because they're, they're the god of working out. It's because I have a habit of not going to the gym when I should. If they're there waiting for me, I go to the gym, Right? That's the way to break the habit. I, I insert a mechanism that makes it a involuntary action, an involuntary thing that I don't have to think about and I don't have to elaborate on and I don't have to, to try and justify doing or not doing. It just happens. That's how real financial change starts. Okay, it's a commitment. It's, it's something that's going to be scary. It's going to be different. It's going to be new. But at the end of the day, that's the only way to change. Okay, so what I want to do here really quick is I want to open this up for some questions. Um, before I do that, 
I do want to take a quick detour because a lot of you guys that are watching are clients. Um, a lot of you guys that are watching, some of you guys aren't clients actually, but I want to show you this is this is one of the tools we have for our clients. If you're a client and you're watching this, um, I'm going to flip Instagram around. If you're not a client, this is a service we provide to our clients. It's called Wealth Dynamics University. Okay, and, and this is basically where you start building, where I start building financial discipline and behavior change and knowledge. Okay, so this is an online interface. It's through Lightspeed VT. My boy Bradley helped us put this together. Um, and this is basically going through literally hundreds and hundreds of videos on finances. Okay, so if I'm going through here and I'm trying to improve my finances, let's say that my thing is debt. I'm struggling with debt and I'm like, how do I get out of debt? What do I do here? I can start going through and learning about that. Gaining financial control. I probably want to watch that one. If I'm trying to get out of debt, I need to understand how to gain financial control. That's a 60 minute video on a course that's going to teach me exactly how to gain control of my finances. How about the great debt buyout? How do I buy out my debt? That's another one I'm probably watching if I need to buy out my debt or pay off my debt. If I'm about to sign up for a sacred account, I can learn about that. Um, if I'm looking at uh, how to become my own bank. There's material I can study on that. How to set up a sacred account. There's material I can study on that. So this is full of some of the best financial ed education you're going to come across um, in many different formats. We have all sorts of calls, webinars, all sorts of things on here. Um, if I want to learn more about investing, let's say I'm there, I can learn about that here. Okay, I can go over here and I can actually go through and I can learn about investing. We have a university inside our university just for investing. If I want to learn about the sacred account, we have a university inside here just for that. If I want to learn about how to use my home to produce assets for me, I can learn about that as well. So that's all in here. Um, and basically what this does is it gives us a way, let me flip Instagram background. It gives us a way to actually help you become financially educated, but I can track like, like as, as a manager in the system, I can see when did you log in? When did you last train? How many segments did you watch? What is your, what is your score? Cause we actually have contests every single month for our clients that are training. Right. So, and there's other stuff in here too. Like there's, um, I don't want to get too distracted, but I love this thing. Um, if I want to, there's my content, right. Let me flip Instagram background. There's my content in here, but let's say that I would, I would like to improve at some other areas. We have other people's content in here as well. So if I click skill shop, um, I can get on Bradley's course. I can get on Cardone University. I can get on, I wouldn't recommend Jordan Belfort, but he is in there. Um, I can get on all sorts of stuff on sales, customer service, um, compliance, teamwork, personal development, marketing. Like this is all material and content that is gonna help me out financially. Right. If this is me, if this is me, uh, I'm probably doing Wealth Dynamics U and I'm probably doing Card on You and Bradley's closing course. And between all of those things, I have financial knowledge, I have training to increase my income. And on top of that, I can actually get tracked on tracked on this, meaning I have a supervisor making sure that I logged in and studied. Um, I have I have accountability. I can actually look at how do I integrate this into my blueprint. We have that accessible in here as well. I can go right to my blueprint by clicking this button here. Okay. So I'm watching all this content. I'm like, how do I implement this? I can go see my financial plan. Right. So guys, I wanted to show that because that's really to wrap all this up. I don't want people to watch this and just be like, oh, if I sign up for a sacred account, my life's going to be better. You'll save more money for sure. I don't know if you're going to make more. I don't know if you're going to do the right things with it once you save it. All of that stuff comes from, from financial education. And so if I'm trying to improve my finances, it's a combination of content, information, education, and implementation, which is the sacred account, to get me there. Now, the good news is, is with our sacred account, with the premium one, when you sign up, you do get access to Wealth Dynamics University. Um, so you have that. It's, it's a two-in-one thing. So we want to make sure you're using both of those. But I mean, if you're a client, let me flip this back around for Instagram. If you're a client, that's where you need to be spending a, a lot of your time is how do I study and improve in these areas? Okay, if you're not a client and you're like, man, I'm not doing well financially, there's your answer. We'll help you educate. We'll help you do all that stuff. But that start, that's where it starts is a commitment to improve. Okay, so really quick, let me open this up for questions. Um, <clears throat> AJ asked a question. He said, how is taking money out of the sacred account different from, let's say, a savings account? 
So that's a really great question. So AJ is asking, he's saying, okay, well, what if I just put the money in a sacred or in a savings account instead? What's the difference there? So a sacred account works like this. I deposit money into it. Okay. And the money that I deposit into my sacred account is going to grow at a three to 5% tax-free interest rate on an annual basis on average, right? That's already better than my bank. Tax-free and three to 5%. I don't make that in my bank. Now, the best thing about this is when I access the money in the sacred account, I'm borrowing against it. So I'm not actually pulling my money out. I'm borrowing against it. When I borrow against it, I'm paying two to 3% interest. And while I'm borrowing, my money is still growing at three to 5%. So it's kind of like, think of a bank account that when you put money into it, they pay you actually real interest rates, not 0 0.10. And when you take the money out, they still pay you like you never took the money out. And that's why with the sacred account, it works so well with paying off debt is it compounds your account value, the entire account value while you're paying off your debt. A bank account won't do that. A bank account, as soon as I withdraw the money to pay off my debt, money's gone from the bank. I'm not getting interest anymore. So that's their main difference there. Um, I hope that makes sense, AJ. Let me see what other questions we have. Oh, AJ, that's Cody. AJ, that's a little covert to change your name like that, man. I'm just kidding. AJ knows what I mean. Um, okay, let me check on, on Facebook here. Let me see what questions we have. What's up, Brad? Alex McCaslin, great to see you. Uh, Josh Fields, thanks for joining. Eric Whitaker says, I was always told that the that that was the way to build credit is to get credit cards and carry a balance. Um, I would look at who told you that. It was, it was probably a bank that sells credit cards. Uh, Eric Hanna, I'm excited for Eric. We did some big stuff today. Jennifer Marks, great to see you. Um, Jacob Meyer says, I never trusted banks and I understand where you were going with this. What specific laws do they use to enforce those lending practices? Isn't that fraud? That's a great question, Jacob. So um, to answer Jacob's question, he's, he's talking about, if you were watching earlier, he was talking about how if, if money is deposited into a bank, the bank is allowed to loan out those deposits, um, even loan out against it with money that they don't actually have. So he's saying, isn't that fraudulent and what, what rules do they have? So there's a, a corporation called the Federal Reserve and it's, it's not federal, it's not a reserve, and it's not a bank, but, but it runs our country's financial system. And it regulates and monitors all the banks. And they have what's called a reserve requirement. Uh, and that would that's what legally gives banks the, the ability to loan money out like that. Now, what most of us weren't paying attention to, um, literally a month ago, this was probably March 26, I think, COVID was strong, market had just crashed. If you went on the um, Federal Reserve's website, I think it was March 26, they gave banks permission to lend against a 0% reserve requirement for the first time ever. Meaning banks, banks, Jacob, don't even have to have a deposit anymore to loan money out. They're loaning out money that doesn't exist. They're creating currency out of thin air at this point. Now, all of us were in hysteria about coronavirus and, and Joe Biden saying crazy things on the internet and, and the stock market crashing. Meanwhile, that just happened a month ago. Public information, almost nobody knows about it. Um, let me see what, see what else we have here. Gary says, great presentation. Um, thank you, Gary. It's great to see you here. Eric Whitaker, sacred account works. So Eric, Eric is saying with him, sacred account works. He's saving over 100K in interest in 30 year, 32 years of time. Um, Eric is using the sacred account currently to pay off his debt is what he's sharing with us. And he's saying the sacred account is going to save him over 100K in interest in 32 years. He's going to pay off his debt sooner, 32 years from what he was on track for. I love that little William Goffner did that little mind blown emoji. Um, Eric Whitaker says, do you see more banks declining HELOC applications or can you get first lien position with another platform? That's another good question. So um, banks, a lot of banks are declining first lien HELOCs. They're not doing a Wells Fargo, KeyBank. A lot of those have stopped. Um, my lender, CMG Financial that we work with, they're still doing them strong. It's their, one of their main products. So they're still fine with it. It basically comes down to your loan to value ratio, credit and personal finances. Uh, Liam Chase, keeping it real with the numbers, 13.3 years. 
I understand what he's saying there. Uh, Megan Watson is asking, is the sacred account interest rate guaranteed? Yes. So the sacred account is guaranteed against loss and it does have a guaranteed minimum interest rate. So what that means is that I'm never going to lose money and I'm always going to make money. And there's no other investment in the world or account in the world that can actually guarantee that the way the sacred account has. Now, keep in mind, take with a grain of salt, the guarantee is only as good as the guarantor. Anyone can guarantee something. What I love about the sacred account, the companies we work with, they've actually kept that guarantee for over 150 years in a row meaning year in and year out, they've actually followed through. So it's a very strong guarantee based on track record. Um, Gene says, good webinar. Thank you, Gene. Great to see you. Um, Jacob Myers is still listening. Great. Fed reduces rates to zero. That's true. That's, that's exactly what I was talking about. Liam just mentioned. Um, Alex McCaslin says, am I at an advantage without having a credit card prior to help build credit? or is credit pointless with the sacred account? So that's a good question. It's not pointless to have credit, but you sh should not, like credit doesn't have to come at my detriment. Meaning to have an established credit, card, card, credit score does not mean that I had to carry these balances and pay a bunch of interest. It means that I have good credit history, meaning that I pay my balances off and down and I make my payments consistently and I don't make them, or I don't miss them. It means that I have a diversification of many credit lines Okay, it could mean I have multiple cards, multiple things out there. Um, and it means that I have low utilization rates, meaning I don't have really high charged up balances. Okay, so what I would do if I was, if I was trying to establish credit, I would probably do um, like a secured credit line. And I would just use that to build my credit up. Um, I can report utilities and different things as well. I would get maybe a few 0% credit lines and, and not use those for anything I can't pay off that month. So if I'm using credit, I'm paying it off the month I use it just to build my credit score up. But it doesn't mean that I have to leave a balance and it doesn't mean that I have to get charged interest or any of that stuff. Um, good question, Alex. All right, let me see what we have on Instagram. Insta, what do we have here? Great to see you guys all. Um, what's up, Laura? Good to see you. Instagram is pretty quiet tonight. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything so far. It looks like actually we might have one question here. Uh, so we have one that says, I'm a 16 year old logo business owner. It's not so big yet. What can I do to grow uh, Man, generate leads? If you're on Instagram, DM people, add followers, do what you can to get leads, follow with them. This is different than the sacred account, but you need to get in front of people, tell them what you're doing. I would do a few logo samples, whatever you've got to do to get in front of people and show them your product. Um, I would go ahead and do that. Great questions. Let me just check Zoom one more time. I want to make sure that we answer all my questions. Um, John Moss, do I qualify for the sacred account? John, you do. I think you have. I think you have Wealth Dynamics. You, you do qualify for it. Um, if you don't have that, I apologize. We're going to get you set up with that first thing as soon as I'm off tonight. If that's not set up for you already, but I think you already have that. Um, so we'll get you taken care of on that. Cody says eight. You had a professional name. So guys, thank you so much. Oh, we do have one more question. What assets do you recommend buying using the sacred account? Um, so I would use uh, the sacred account to buy things like real estate, um, to buy things like private lending, um, you know, things that are going to cash flow. Because the thing is that I'm paying myself back when I borrow. I'm my own bank, so I'm going to have to pay back every month when I borrow. Um, and so I want to buy something or invest in something that actually produces an income. So I'm not speculating. Um, or any of that. I'm, I'm putting that into a deal that pays me every single month. We have deals that do that. We just helped this week, probably close to half a million dollars from clients that they're going to invest in deals exactly like that this week. So we can help out with that. But the, 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 the first thing is get the sacred account established first as a primary action. Then we can start looking at the investments. Um, Alex McCaslin has a question. I'm very interested in using my unemployment income to start my account. Is that advisable? Um, I would highly recommend we get you some, some income. Um, you could use unemployment 
I'm not a fan of that. Obviously, I would like to see you earning more income. I understand if that's where you're at, that's where you're at. Let's get your income up for sure. Um, but there's no reason you couldn't. Income is income at the end of the day. You're still going to save it, whether it's from employment or unemployment, then that's a better place to put it than a bank. But definitely produce more. Um, we have a concept called the triangle of income, knowledge, value, exchange. So that's something that's going to help out quite a bit. So I hope that helps, guys. I am going to log off here. Um, we're running a little bit over tonight, but I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I really appreciate it. We'll be back again next week. If you saw anything here that you're interested in learning more about, send me a message. I'm always happy to answer and help out. Um, and let's talk to you again soon. All right, guys, have a great weekend.